You know, we had Luke Detella on the podcast today, and we went into so many different directions. He is the co-founder of Frank August, but he is so much more than that. We talked about his career as a surfer, him as a father, a serial entrepreneur, and we kind of got into some conspiracy theories, but let's just get into it. You know where you are! This is the Outliers Podcast. Let's go! So you're near down the shore. You've been, have you, have you always lived in Jersey? Were you, like, where were you born? I was born in Vermont. Really? I'm from Vermont. I'm from Vermont. I grew up in Stowe until we moved to Jersey um, right around, I'm going to date myself right now, 1985. Mm -hmm. And um, we moved to Ocean City, New Jersey. My dad started a flooring company with one of his buddies. And um, yeah, so we moved when I was young and then um, started competing for surfing. So I started traveling when I was like 11. No way. Yeah. So and it's probably rare to have like a pro, like become, having a surfing career from Jersey, right? I think then it was. Now it's not. Really? Yeah. Now it's like Jersey's a hub. No way. Yeah. There's a lot of pro surfers from Jersey now. Is there, why, there's good waves in Jersey? Really good. Really? We have some of the better beach breaks in the world when it's good. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the town I live in, and it was intentional, has yeah. probably one of the best, you know, best waves on the East Coast when it's good. That's why we live there. What was that lifestyle like, just like going from island to island or just traveling just for surfing? It was a lot. I mean, I came from a family that didn't skew from having a nine to five. And yeah. my parents didn't make much money growing up at all. Um, you know, we didn't really have cars and all that kind of stuff. So for me to have the capability of just like, you know, getting on planes and going to these exotic places that most of my family had never even you know heard of mm-hmm. was pretty different. Um, but I think that's kind of what broke me out of that nine to five mold of like s- security and just work until you can have enough to retire. Yeah. And it, my mind from a young age was like, I'm never falling into that. Yeah. You know, that that social programming of like, you have to go and do this. So it it was kind of the, the 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 first step in my evolution to doing everything that we're doing now. Yeah, man. And especially I'm assuming like traveling all over the world also opens your mind to hold a whole other world. You know what I mean? Like the like your your mind is open to being inspired by so many different people and you're seeing so many different walks of life and how people are living their life. And you're probably doing a lot of things you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was exposed to, to a lot and, you know, um, I remember like a super poignant thing that happened in a place in Mexico um, called Puerto Escondido, which is pretty built up and Americanized now yeah. compared to what it was when, when I used to go there. But um, I still have pictures of it, actually. Like I was staying in this <clears throat> this beautiful place and we had all these rooms across the, the upper floor. And um, there was a shack, like a literal shack smaller than this room that was like right in the yard in front. And there was like, I don't know, eight or nine kids a mom and a dad that lived in it what? and every day we i'd watch the dad come home from work and how happy everybody was and i just realized that like i think we're a little too caught up in 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 other things that you know um should be making us happy and, and meaning a lot more in life like they were the happiest people i i've probably seen to this day and wow. they have this little shack and every every day I came home was the same way. Yeah, it's like, like that symbolism is beautiful. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's like you just said that story, and at first I had like so much empathy, but realizing like, dude, he might be fucking. He's living the life. The guy might be fucking psyched. Yeah, it seemed to me like he was psyched. He, yeah, like, and his kids were pumped. He's probably going and pouring cement foundations for something somewhere yeah. in Puerto Escondido, and going home and just you know, drinking tequila and, yeah. and, yeah. and just like, living it up. Yeah, and it, it, to me that kind of just like, I don't know. I think little lessons like that throughout my life have, have calib- recalibrated me every time, you know, mm-hmm. but it's also all contributed to the idea of like building these different things that I've built and knowing that they could all go away mm-hmm. and I'd still probably be happy, you know? Were you always like so entrepreneurial? Like how did a surfer, I mean, you spoke one time before yeah. at my, at mom, Vincent's uh, networking event. I remember mm-hmm. just talking to you and I'm really like, dude, this dude's doing like so many fucking things. <laughs> and the fact that you started as a pro surfer, like, where's the on did, were you always entrepreneurial were you always like doing different things or like how did that you know out? i think it i think f- surfing is such an individual sport yeah like you're competing and you you know you have a team if you're if you're good enough you have a team behind you and you have coaches and 
all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, you're making all the decisions yourself, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think that played into my subconscious, realizing, like, that the a surfer spirit is probably kind of similar to certain entrepreneurial spirits in the mm -hmm. sense that you're building it yourself. So for me, it was just a natural evolution. Like, I just knew one thing I never wanted to do was sit in an office. Like, that was just not happening. Yeah. And if I was going to work for anyone and make anyone money, I wanted it to be myself. It's funny. I teach my three-year-old every day. We, I take him to school, and I'm like, who do you want to work for when you, get, when you grow up? And he's like, someone else. And I'm like, nope, yourself. So now he says himself. Yeah. And, you know, it's this thing that I think I just inherently realized early on that I'd rather make less money working for myself than more money working for someone else and, and living underneath them there. Yeah. Guys of how I needed to be, you know, operating on a daily basis. So what was like the first, what was your first move? What was the first like entrepreneurial experience, success or failure? What was like that first thing you did? The first company I actually started, um, when I met my wife, uh, she was really, really well connected in, in New York city. Mm -hmm. And, um, I met one of her friends who, Hosted parties, not in the promoter type. Like he did brand parties and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I like met or events. Yeah, and like we hit it off. So we actually started a company together that I was only involved in for like four months. Mm -hmm. And he took it on to do a bunch of other stuff. But that was kind of my first foray into like you know forming a company with my name on it and LLC and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then um, you know. Since then, I was still a pro surfer for all those years, and I still, you know, surf for Quicksilver now. Mm -hmm. um, that was still kind of the day to day, and then you know, I had ideas for building other brands, but I didn't have the capital or the network to really like pull those capital strings to build things yet. Mm -hmm. So I basically just kept networking th through being in the city all the time and things like that, and then all these ideas that I'd had over the years started executing on them. And what was that? Ne so what was the next? What, what what was the next thing after that, after that PR, after that company you made with that guy? I mean, I guess you could consider it. I I got pulled off the street by a casting director in New York City. Yeah. And I was put in a, in a film. And then that translated into um, I did a bunch of modeling work. Mm -hmm. And then that was around the time Instagram happened. Mm -hmm. And then Instagram happened. And I gained a following because of my surfing and modeling work. That translated into brand partnerships. Yeah. So instead of just doing the things that most people do with brand partnerships, I, I networked with the brands and got to know, you know, the CEOs and the, and the people behind the brands, so that they understood that I had a more of a skill set than just like posting a photo. On yeah, you want to be like, hey, let me let me actually associate myself. So with I this guess brand. you could consider it. You know, I, I formed a holdings company called the Tell Holdings, and because of the social media world, I was introduced to a lot of people who asked me to either come in and do advisory work, you know, for equity, things mm -hmm. like that. So I started building this holdings company that I guess became my second company yeah. that now owns, you know, large chunks of 11 different companies mm -hmm. at the moment, actually. What, what do you have the largest stake in, in like within your time, not even just financially? What are you putting the most amount of your time and energy into right now? Most amount of my bandwidth towards? Yeah. Uh... Frank August. Yeah. Yeah, the bourbon, you know. And it's ultimately, I don't have a day-to-day -day role mm -hmm. for the brand, um, you know, as far as, like, it being, like, oh, I'm the marketing director, I'm this, yeah. I'm the CR, I'm that. Um, every day, though, I do, you know, whether it's, you know, introducing someone to the brand, talking to existing accounts about the brand that I open mm -hmm. on-premise or off-premise, things like that. Um, and I designate a, a huge chunk of my life to my family like that's one thing that i don't jeopardize so um but if you were to look at the companies frank august roads of new york which is the furniture company mm -hmm. um right now which is kind of in its infancy even though we're doing quite a bit of work and then i i just built i was just contracted to build a brand from the ground up a, a cannabis brand that's launching um next year and then um yeah, there's a bunch of other projects like that. So, how did Frank August come about? Because this is such a competitive market. You know? Yeah, like being able to be to be like, "Fuck it, I'm about to start a bourbon <laughs> company." You know, like yeah. Um, it it was always this conversation. So, myself and two of my buddies, my my friend Thompson Harrell, who was in my wedding party, and um, the guy who's now the CEO in Frank August, Jonathan Crocker. Mm -hmm. I met Jonathan through um, through brand 
their brand um, engaging activities. Yeah, um, he was the the global VP at um, AG or sorry, yeah, AG, mm-hmm. Adriana Goldschmidt Jeans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we met. We hit it off because you know when we met at this dinner, we both had on big brimmed hats and we started talking about our affinity for Bob Dylan and mm-hmm. just kind of all these different things in life and you know these different design elements and things we really shared um, love for and. So we kind of curated this friendship. I was already friends with Thompson. And Thompson is, you know, arguably one of the the best advertising branding minds in the world. Um, you know, he has multiple Cannes Lion Awards um, for his branding work on commercials and things like that. And so it was kind of this, like, it was always in me that I wanted to start a, a, a spirits brand. And, mm-hmm. it, and it was going to be whiskey. And I I had this, you know... This thing that always happened every time we were all together is that we would drink bourbon and we would have these really enriching conversations, whether it was about family life, our wives, you know, art, whatever it was. And so it just kind of took that little bit of inspiration to be like, we should start this. And it, at first it was kind of like, yeah, what, you know, let's, we just massage the conversation mm-hmm. and we would always, you know, we would always talk about it. And every time Jonathan was in the city, we, you know, we would, we would all, you know, be like, Hey, here's some ideas. You know, we would always talk about these different ideas. And then Thompson kind of started loosely just like brainstorming a deck. Cause that's just what he does. Yeah. So he was taking our conversations and kind of just like putting the pieces together of what the characteristics and identity of this thing could be. And, um, COVID happened. And when COVID happened, as everyone knows, you know, everything slowed down. Yeah. So we kind of leaned into it then. We were like, well, we have this free time. Let's, let's. Don't think of release. Yeah. Right? It's like creatively you're like stuck in your house and you're like, all right, let's at least have a conversation. Yeah. So we started that, really kind of like, yeah. So we kind of really started, you know, diving into why bourbon? What can we do in that space that's different? Who do we know in the space? All those different kinds of things. And, um, you know, we had such a. We had such a, a rich response from the few people that we kind of spoke to about it that we were like, okay, we, we, we should really like, you know, really dive into this. And um, at that point in time, we had some relationships within the spirits world, you know, both from from Thompson and Jonathan's careers, from me being, I did some ambassador work for different liquor portfolios. Um, and uh, one of them loved the idea so much they flew all three of us to to Kentucky in the middle of the pandemic. They flew, no way. They flew chefs in and had us this dinner and, you know, they wanted to partner with us. And I think at that point in time, we were like, fuck, we have something really special. And at that point in time, we had it fully built the brand. Yeah. So then we were like, okay, you know, if we have something that these guys see as being this valuable, you know, let's, let's really build it. So we built this 120 page go to market strategy, m- marketing, you know, sales targets, brand identity, like we built this entire thing all essentially virtually through just sitting on computers with each other. And um, when we got to the point where it was ready to go, you know, um, Jonathan really out of the three of us exhibited the only characteristics to be an actual CEO. So we asked him, he, you know, he was, he was making a lot of money in his current role. And we were like, you know, we would, you're the only one out of the three of us. We, you know, love to all be equal share and just let's try to build this. And he resigned from his position. Damn, dude. And we raised the money on our own and, you know, launched the brand two years ago. Actually, last week was the first, you know, shipment to being on a shelf. And um, it, uh, yeah, it just was off to the races from there. Rookie question from is, what's the difference between whiskey and bourbon? Before I go into any other questions, is there like any is there any like particular difference? There is, and it depends who you ask. Yeah, you know, it, it used to be kind of an unknown thing that bourbon was made in Kentucky. Yeah, that's you like know, the biggest. That's all. It is, right? um, nowadays, it's 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 mucky. Everybody kind of uses bourbon as a as a you know marketing ploy, um, but that's why you're not able to say Kentucky straight bourbon mm-hmm. if you're not a Kentucky straight bourbon, which we okay. are. So we're still what any very you know, experienced bourbon drinker would consider real authentic bourbon. Technically, you know, the the juice that was in our first bottles um, is a bottled and bond juice, which was an act that was um, put in place to basically secure authenticity. You know, it basically means that everything was done in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, And that's what our juice is. So that kind of gave us the validation of the, the bourbon community. 
you know, because we're three guys from Jersey. Two are from New York. No, one's from L.A. Okay. So it's like three city guys building, you know, a bourbon brand. Like, what gave us the the right to do that? And and so, yeah, that's that's kind of um, off track a little bit, but no, not off yeah. track at all. I'm, <laughs> dude, if anything, I'm actually now I'm gonna call fucking bourbon juice. <laughs> that's when you know you're a badass. It's just like that. I feel like that's the language. Jenna, you mind grabbing glass of the ice? <laughs> um, I've never heard someone saying calling it juice. Yeah, it's it's it's. I, I'm just ingrained by saying it now. I don't think I d- I didn't do it before I was an owner. Of it. Yeah. Man. What was the process of like cr- creating it though, man? Like, was it an actual tasting? Like, and like knowing certain flavor notes that you wanted because. Yeah. So we we knew we knew around where we wanted our mash bill to fall, which we don't disclose the yeah. exact mash bill. Um, we kind of knew where we wanted it to fall. You know, Jonathan has a really elevated palate. Um, he actually has his distiller's license now since we started the brand. Oh, wow. Um, and he has access to some really, really incredible people in the bourbon space. Um, Drew Colvzine, who's the the master distiller and owner of Willet, mm-hmm. which is arguably the most coveted, mm-hmm. you know, bourbon in the space. Um, that was the first call we made that Jonathan made was like, hey, if you didn't own Willet, who would you go to to produce your juice? Who would your lawyer be? You know, and Drew was was extremely gracious and kind of opening the doors for us. And when he did that, it kind of gave us this insight to the industry and 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 a little bit of validation that what we were doing was really special. And um, so when we started getting out there and kind of you know telling the story of what we wanted to build, we actually you know had the support of the bourbon industry because we're trying to modernize bourbon and like utilize the foundation that's been built all these years by these incredible families until the next chapter which is a much more encompassing story of bourbon um so yeah so that's kind of how it i feel like that would be super intimidated to do all of that dude this is fucking <laughs> this is serious man just the top of alone so just the detail work of the bottle yeah so like, every every touch point of the brand we we, we were pretty meticulous this is about. this is like a this feels like a five pound gold plate so right here we actually have we have a we have a guy that follows us on on the frank august social media that shot it with a gun no way yeah. and, and what happened it, nothing no way just like a dent but yeah this is badass um every touch point of the brand we really wanted to be as as meticulous and, and design for it as possible you know a lot of the brand is is rooted in american design mm-hmm. um a lot of the inspiration came from the ray and charles eames and, you know francis knowles and the largest and, bourbon glass ever yeah. I will definitely make sure I don't fill this <laughs> i should have brought a bourbon so it's all good, man. i'll feel a little bit i don't know if you want some uh, I'll, I'll take a. I'll take. I mean, it's National Bourbon Day, right? I kind of have to. I just. You got. I love that. You guys want to try it? I'll have him try it. Yeah. For sure. uh, usually, I'd recommend. Cheers, bro. Yeah. Usually, I'd recommend one cube, mm. but that's okay. <laughs> there are significantly more in it before I take some out. Wow, man. This it, it really. I'm not, I'm not because I'm right in front of you. It's <laughs> actually genuinely smooth. You get that bite that you want, yeah. but it's just this nice smoky. It's a hundred proof too. So, you know, usually when you hear the word smooth within, within bourbon particularly, it, it, it kind of connotates, you know, the lack of complexity, mm-hmm. but ours truly is smooth, but you know, but complex I, at the same oh, time. Oh, for sure. So, yeah. When you're, when you're tasting bourbon and whiskey, what flavor notes are you looking for? Like talk me through when you're I mean, sampling, like what are you... Personally, yeah. the, the things that I like, yes. it's not even what I look for. It's just what my palate gravitates yes. towards is like the, the vanillas, the, you know, maybe a little bit of black currants, those kinds of those kinds of flavor notes. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just me. Everybody's different. Yeah. You know, um, some people don't even look for different flavor notes. They just look for the overall flavor, you know, yeah. like front palate, mid palate, you know, after, after, you know, after taste, mouthfeel, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm a pretty simple drinker, honestly. Yeah. You know, I get a little weird when it comes to wine, but when it comes to bourbon, it's it's really I like a van, I like a vanilla kind of, you know, flavor profile. So. Yeah, I like it how it just doesn't it's just like it depends. I don't want to like have a too much of an aggressive bite that I feel like I'm gonna cough or something. But I don't know if it's because I'm drinking more hard alcohol, like you're in the fall. <laughs> now it's like an alcoholic. But like <laughs> But I can put it down a little too easy now as I'm gone older. Yeah. Back in the day as a kid, man, it'd be like, oh <laughs> Yeah. But I, I, well, that's because you're it's your palate. Your palate 
you know, but I guess it's like spice, right? Yeah, it, it you know, and that's what you get with Frank. You, with Frank August, you get you know the different baking spices that come through, like mm-hmm. allspice and things like that. But yeah, what you're saying, your palate evolves the same way we do. Mm-hmm. When we grow, your mm-hmm. palate grows. Even just being 21, though, like you're, there's a reason why in college everyone's just drinking like you know Bud Lights or like yeah. Coors Lights. Like now, like it's not even me trying to sound cool. Like, dude, if I can't drink light beers, I wish I could. Yeah, I wouldn't have as big of a gut. But like, <laughs> it just is water. Yeah. And now, like the IPAs, you want more of those flavor notes, especially with this bourbon. Well, you start getting into like you know you can get nerdy about it too, right? Our, our subconscious, as far as how we're attracted to certain products and things like that, a lot of us. Uh, Majority of, of humanity doesn't even understand why they like certain products, even though they like them. Mm. And I think that with with certain spirits and things like that, there's an artistry that goes into it, right? So some people connect to that kind of stuff without really knowing it. Like you know, winemakers and, and master distillers and, and and the like. I mean, the stuff that they do is it's it's amazing to to witness, like how good they are at what they do. And it's a craft, so people get into that, and I think that kind of like reflects on. You know how they drink, yeah. Essentially, not everyone, but mm-hmm. a, a larger portion of of the population probably gets into that. And I think, think, and I think, going back to that, it's, it, especially with like this, especially when it comes to like bourbon or whiskey or even just any beverage. Now that I'm feeling this bottle, right? It doesn't. Let's say if there wasn't a beverage in this, like every detail legitimately matters. Yeah, yeah, that's how we created the. We, you know, we designed like the you can't also. just like you can have the best tasting product, but if you're also like, if if this if this quote unquote juice was literally in a plastic container, flimsy, had a whack label, I don't know if people's perception would be the same. Is that something that goes into it as well yeah, when you yeah. design the product? One hundred percent. Yeah, especially to be successful. We wanted all of the you know touch points of the brand. We wanted it to be minimalistic in the sense that it had you know it had its own. <clears throat> confidence in understated under, under in understatement right mm-hmm. um so we designed the bottle you know ourselves to to be that and to be like a keepsake so we wanted it to be a thing that people didn't throw out yeah. afterwards and that's why the back label is clear and it peels right off it doesn't leave any residual the neck comes off all that kind of stuff how long did it take you just to just to develop the defining the right packaging and the what what bourbon you want to put into the bottle um the, I think the you know I don't quite remember the timelines to be honest with you. Yeah, it's such a blur. And started really running it, but yeah. um, you know it it was a while. It was like a year and change, mm-hmm. you know, before we dialed everything in and really knew. I think we all kind of had a had an idea of what we wanted the bottle to look like from mm-hmm. the beginning. You know, we all had sketches and things like that that we that we used to design it when we were doing the three D molds. So the bottle shape itself came pretty quick, but everything else originally was going to potentially be a glass topper and then we decided against it and yeah this is badass picking out the color of the metal for the topper was a pretty yeah excruciating process yeah this is like a statement with like a whole laundry lift like a whole bag of different metals that barely look different so like that was a process but yeah yeah what aspects of frank august you enjoy doing the most or developing Um, i think my favorite thing about the brand is just you know, introducing people to it, mm-hmm. right? Because it's much more than just a bourbon brand. We, um, we, we really wanted to build a brand that could could dent culture and connect people. So my favorite thing is doing tastings. You know, mm-hmm. like I do a lot of private tastings in people's homes. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of unique thing that we do that we never set out to do. It just kind of like evolved and has happened. Where I get requests from you know people within my network or people that bring someone in. That are, that are in my network, and, and they're like, well, I want to do a tasting for 10 people. How does it work? And, mm-hmm. you know, we don't charge for it. I'll just show up with, with our expressions. We have, you know, multiple expressions of bourbon, and I just walk everybody through it. But before we taste it, I, I walk them through the actual brand, um, sometimes with the actual brand deck so they can really see it. And just seeing people's interest and response and, and what we're building is, is really cool. And gratifying that, you know, we took that long to build it. So, yeah. yeah. And when you're saying expressions with the bourbon, what do you mean by that? So we have – so that's a that's a small batch, right? Mm-hmm. And then um, it's basically skews, mm-hmm. right? Like like you have a, a – Yeah, flavors, a, whatever exactly. it may be, juices, whatever it may be. So we have Just. a small batch. We have a single barrel release yeah. that we do once a year. And then we have what we call a case study, which mm-hmm. is kind of a play on the federal government's um, affordable housing project was called case study 
back, what? back when they created it. And we thought that was a really unique reference to, you know, American design. Mm-hmm. Um, so our, what our case study is, is it's our small batch, which will, is what you're, what you're tasting. Mm-hmm. And we take it and then we age it in something different. Like last year was a Japanese Mizunara oak barrels, right? This year we did XOPO brandy casks. Um, and it kind of just, it changes the whole complexity and taste of the, of the juice. So, so technically we have, you know, we have four four expressions if you count both case studies, but we only do the case study release once. Once we launch it once, it's it's gone and then we go on to the next next one. So yeah. How intimidating was it to just to start and continue? Because there's just so much out there. Or it's just like we, f- I think we knew what we had. Yeah. Right? That like the validation that happened by by talking to industry insiders of mm-hmm. what we were building and how different it was and how even though, yes, it's a bourbon, so we technically have competitors. When you look at the X, Y axis, which is nerdy mm-hmm. you know, shit. No, but yeah, what is it? When you look at it and you see where we sit in the, in the, in the modern elevated area, there's really no one that's, that's there. You know, There's a couple bourbons that have tried, and there's some newer ones out that are kind of in there. But yeah. for the most part, they're all heritage. You know, The stories that you hear in bourbon are all you know, a family who's – Great great grandfather. Yeah, two hundred years ago. Two hundred yeah. yeah, down a creek and yeah. some of them are, you know, some of them are, are you know, made up mm-hmm. and some aren't, you know, but there was kind of the same story over and over again. Mm-hmm. And the ones that are true are are absolutely incredible because they built this industry. And, you know, we kind of saw an opportunity to to really use that foundation and bring new drinkers into the space as well as as, you know, attract fans of bourbon. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, so for us, I don't really think there was an intimidation factor. And honestly, if you were to meet Thompson and Jonathan, there's really – they don't – there's no – intimidating Jonathan, I think, would, would take a serious, a serious, serious group of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, his father was a general in the mil- in the U.S. military, and you can see it in his demeanor. Like, he's he's very much like – that's why he's a CEO. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Like, what, what characteristics that like, you were like, hey, he's going to be the CEO? Because you're obviously very confident in your own skin. You're a leader. You're naturally – I'm not a CEO, though. Yeah, so know? what about him makes him a CEO, or what ma- What do you think makes a good CEO? I, th- I think his ability – you know, his, his ability to scale a brand, number mm-hmm. one. I mean, what he scaled – you know, what he scaled AG to do w- was, you know, nine figures a year – that they went from, you know, significantly less than that. And, um, you know, supply chain issues, dealing with, you know, all these different moving parts mm-hmm. at once, even though I can do it, I can't do it to the level that a top level brand needs. And I don't pretend I could. Yeah. You know, there was definitely some things that he, that, that, that Jonathan's done that I think we could learn how to do, but mm-hmm. he's so good at them already that why wouldn't you just let that go? You know what I mean? Um, I think for us, for Thompson and I, we were looking for, you know, when when it all happened, we were kind of just looking at each other. And it was like, I don't think either one of us can can wants to deal with that or or could, honestly, you know. And Jonathan had every attribute of a CEO already. You know, he was a C-suite executive. So it was kind of yeah. like, let him run with it. And I mean, the job he's done, it's it's incredible to witness, like, how he operates as a single person you know our team is three of us that's it and i would say from a day-to-day basis you know he's doing 90 percent of the lifting because he inherently has to as a ceo yeah the 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 amount of balls he juggles though on a daily basis to grow this thing and yeah into a a award-winning i mean we've won we've won you know, double gold now at, at the San Francisco Spirit Awards multiple times for, for our SKUs. And, and, you know, we had a 98 rating um, a couple weeks ago. I saw that on, on IG. Yeah. It's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah and I mean, just balancing the growth. And, and you have to look five years ahead in, in bourbon because you're aging. Uh, you're aging your product, right? So he has the ability to look at this trajectory and be like, okay, we need to start planning for 20, what is it? We're in 2029. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I can't do that. Yeah. That's not something I can fucking do. And I don't want to either. Yeah, man. You know, because that's, that's a whole planning aspect that just doesn't exist in my 
in my like purview and how I operate. So, did you did you raise capital only once so far? If you, are you continuing to raise capital? Well, so we we did an initial friends and family raise and we 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 hit it relatively quickly. Yeah. Um, and we've done one raise since then, but I think we're we're pretty much done because we have access to credit lines. Mm. And you know, so different... to say you probably need a fuck ton of money to compete, no? Or to get no, that? no, that that's the thing. I mean, what we raised, we raised a lot of money, but yeah. you know, I think. Because of the value proposition of our brand, we, you know, we were able to not raise as much as other companies have had to when they're startups, and we absorb all the startup cost. I would probably never take a salary from the brand because mm-hmm. it's just not in my my thought process to sit there and be like I'm doing this eight hours a day. Mm-hmm. Um, my mind comes in the form of equity, you know, mm-hmm. when ultimately we we get to whatever the end goal is. Yeah. So and what is the end goal? Just to sell. Not you know, just to sell, but sell to a larger. Our, our goal is to build as much long-term value as humanly possible, mm-hmm. and then when the opportunities present themselves, we'll obviously look at what those opportunities are. But you know, the that space is is a seller's space. You know, there's a lot of acquisitions that have happened. Everyone's got a number. Yeah. Um, but you know, we're we're building the brand, and we'll be involved in the brand even after that happens, mm-hmm. if it happens. Yeah. You know, so. And then when you said before about the um, differentiator, what really differentiate? Because you keep on saying that, you know, what Frank August offers. I know this is a really cool brand and yeah. it tastes really good. But, like, what are the differentiators between this and the other bourbons? So we're, we're a modern representation of what bourbon can be and what it can represent basically to the world at large, right? So what we did was we, we did a really d- deep dive into what it meant to be American when we built this thing. And what we uncovered is, like, through all – cultures across the world that hold, have these icons, majority of them are Americans, but they're not looked at as Americans. They're just looked at global icons, like the Bob Dylans, the Francis Knowles, the Sidney Portiers, the, the you know, Robert Redford's, like any of that, Paul mm-hmm. Newman, um, you know, and we realized that there was this really, really unique fabric that existed that we could kind of tell our story on, which, which is the, you know, the American basis of our brand is a lot different than all these other brands in the sense that we wanted people to look at these icons and think of America in a much more positive way of what we've contributed to the creative world, right? Mm -hmm. So when you look at our brand and you look at all of our socials and you look at how we, you know, tell our story, there's a common thread amongst all of it where we incorporate everybody, Mm -hmm. you know? So our idea was to create a bourbon for everyone by everyone. So our, our story includes all of America because you know, bourbon's America's native spirit, right? It was connotated by the Congress, by, by U.S. Congress. That's what mm-hmm. it's called. And so our brand is, you know, Frank August, America's spirit. Um, and we wanted to really lean into that side of it, which no brand had done yet. Some brands talked about the American spirit thing, but they had to really lean into what it meant, what it really meant to be American. Mm-hmm. So that's what we've done. It just makes you feel like a, like... When I was looking at the brand, it reminds me of like the Dosecki's Dos like most interesting man in the world, but in a very classy way, elevated with like way. George Clooney, elevated, just like a very like smoke a cigar, just like the ultimate American man, which yeah. is badass. Where did Frank August the name come from? So conceptually, Frank was my father, mm-hmm. and August is Thompson's son's middle name, mm-hmm. right? So the idea behind the brand it's not it's not a, it's not a human. Um, the idea behind the brand, even though that was where the name conceptually came from, is taking the better lessons of our past. My, f- my father was really well respected. He was a veteran. He had an open door policy with everybody that ever came into to our home and, and took care of people. Even if he didn't have it, he'd give you the shirt off his back. So we, we were taking the better lessons of our past and uniting them with the hope of the future, essentially. So we wanted to create a space where, like, you know, social decorum and, and the ability to sit down and talk about, you know, Things that are conflicting, if you have a conflicting view, but do it in a in a, in a respectful way. Mm-hmm. So, you're such a th- deep thinker, man, and like how you're conceptualizing your thoughts and articulate on. Oh, it wasn't just me. Brand. It's 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 this is this is all of us. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's just it's a culmination. I I, I told the guys the other day in a text. We, we we put out a pretty big press release about a partnership that we have happening, and and you know we were talking, and I was like, look, guys, I'm just going to call it what it is, and the brand's a unicorn, right? And I don't mean it in the sense of how they talk about it in the tech space. I mean, the fact that all three of us came together against all these different odds and things like that, and launched a 
bourbon brand of all things, and and it's it's having the success it's having. Yeah. Um, I think it took a lot of DNA from all three of us to make all of the things that we're talking about become reality because it's not any one of us. Then how are you getting it into all these stores and just getting the distribution? <clears throat> um, we you know, in the beginning started reaching out to tastemakers within the spirits and bourbon space and mm-hmm. just telling them the story of the brand and what we wanted to do and they took to it. So they kind of helped us build the foundation. Um, and they've been, you know, huge components of the growth of the brand. Um, and then, you know, since we have that validation from the, you know, the bourbon community, it's given us this platform to be able to go out and confidently talk about the brand and you know, um, there's a lot of organic growth that happens when you have that that backing, you mm-hmm. know, um, of that community. And, you know, now, I mean, we open as many doors personally ourselves as we possibly can. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I go into multiple new locations a week and talk with owners and bar managers and stuff and do the same thing we're doing right now. I, I talk about all this stuff. Yeah. And, you know, they, they form this connection to the brand that is kind of undeniable. And, you know, we've been really fortunate that some of the better places in every state we're in have taken an affinity to the brand and and worked with us and putting us in the cocktail menu and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that's, that's people find it there too. There's a brand exploration that happens there. So do you like when, when this, when this is being used in a cocktail menu, the right cocktails? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's cool to see it. And, you know, when you go to a place like, um, you know, have you guys been to the butcher's block? Yeah. You guys have seen the block. So you go there and you see our cocktail on the menu at the block, you know, what Tommy's built at the block as an institution. So you go in there and you see, you know, we run the night, which is an espresso martini. And you see the first thing is Frank August bourbon, you know, and then their ingredients. It's amazing to see that it leads to this organic brand discovery for someone reading it. Cause they're like, if they haven't had it or know what it is, they're like, well, it's on the menu here at the block. Then it's gotta be good. Yeah. What is it? And then, you know, our job as co-founders is to educate the staff's, on what our brand is. Mm -hmm. So we try to make it a point to go in and educate the entire staff on the brand so then they can talk about it from an elevated perspective and, you know, communicate what exactly we're doing and what the brand is. And that's kind of what's led to the to the growth. Is that like kind of the focus point is really the now just to get more and more distributors and then they go, they have like themselves. We're on pretty strict allocation right now. I think we're in 17 markets now. Um, And it's only because we, you know, you can't, you can't project to sell X amount of cases and then all of a sudden double that because your juice is aging. So yeah. you have to play in this space of planning. So we're still, you know, we're still under pretty strict allocation with all of our distributors, meaning like, you know, a lot of places can't get it yet. Yeah. And still also in the infant stage, right? You're still drawing to like... Yeah, I mean, we're two years old. Out. Yeah, compared to these other guys who are like 100, 200 years. I mean, yeah, some of these some of these brands have been around forever. Yeah, They've man. started this industry, so... You mentioned Butcher Block, man. That really, they really are an institute, dude. Yeah, it's crazy. It's a fucking scene. It really <laughs> is. Like they've made themselves like like the biggest restaurant in Jersey. I feel like now. I mean, I'd argue that they're probably one of the biggest restaurants in the East Coast. Yeah, I would think. You know, I mean, he Tommy releases, you know, reservations online, and it's like it's like Rolling Stones releasing fucking tickets. And it's fucking. <laughs> it's not like it's a cheap dinner. No. What about it? Do you feel like because you're you're a branding guy, you're a marketing guy, you you obviously understand like how how humans react to things. Like, what about it? You feel like is drawing people that go there. I mean, scarcity is a is a is a great mm. selling point, right? You know, you create that exclusive experience, and then in turn, it results in scarcity of you know either commodity or reservations. And inherently, we humans want what they can't have. Yeah. Right. That's part of it. But you got to create a space that people want to be in in the first place. Right. And what I think Tommy's and the team has done so well at the block is they've created such an incredible, aesthetically pleasing space from every detail that we don't really take into consideration until you learn about it from the lighting levels to the music volume level to what playlists are on to where things are, you know placed around the room, the furniture, mm-hmm. the colors, everything, palettes, all that stuff. So I think he just, yeah, it's just, I I, I don't think he, you know, he hasn't done a thing wrong. I mean, he hasn't put a foot wrong. Everything that they do is like a fucking home run there. Yeah. So And even, I think he's also hit a certain level that like, even if he does do like a random Instagram post that some other brand could do, 
like that does, and you're, they'll be like, "What the hell is that?" Yeah, well, because it's the butcher block. It just is looked down on a certain level. Did you? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like like if Drake comes out with a song, if it was anybody else, it'd be like a, it'd be like, "Oh, okay." Yeah. But it's Drake. He now has this. I'm not saying you know what I'm trying to say. Like yeah. he definitely has this high, high level yeah. butcher block. Yeah, it's. I mean, did you? Did like you, the most recent post. I like the Step Brothers. It was just like his dad and the other guy. And oh, like they're like, and his body. Oh, yeah, and it's and it's fucking funny. Yeah, I mean, all that plays into it too, right? Like their their they're not, content creation team's incredible. Yes, authentically um, themselves. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I, it's, I, I think some of their content's fucking hysterical. I mean, he did. They did a post with kids. Did you ever see that one? No. There was a restaurant down by us that basically said like, We're, kids aren't allowed here anymore, <laughs> right? So Tommy did a thing where his kids came in and they were like pissing on the walls and like they were like fucking throwing food across the room and shit and it's like you see that as a parent i mean i have two kids and i'm like i want to take my kids there yeah like he's just taking like you know he's taking jabs without being distasteful about it and it's like you know it, it all plays into the whole you know aura of that place yeah it's kind of like a like a rock store approach it's almost like when you think traditional steakhouse, you think white tablecloth, classical music, bright lights. You're thinking of like a Frank Sinatra. That, that one's like the fucking complete opposite, yeah. which is sick. Yeah. It makes that, that, that sex appeal to it, you yeah. know? Everyone's no, in t-shirts I, instead of a tuxedo. And the other thing, too, everybody tries to do, and you guys know this, anywhere outside of New York City tries to replicate a New York City experience. That's yeah. just what they do. Yeah. Globally. Oh, this this restaurant, you know, what, what's the thing you'd say to someone if you went to a restaurant in the middle of the country and it was like brick with black with... You know, good music. You'd be like, it had a very like New York vibe to it. Mm. Tommy created a fucking you know top level New York City restaurant in New Jersey, and that has drawn that New York City crowd because they all go there in the summer there, and it's kind of just done this. It's been wild to watch the growth of that place. Yeah, man, especially because you're in South Jersey or Central Jersey, or whatever you call it. I don't like know. Want... I'm not getting involved in that. Yeah. I would hate that argument. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's like it's an awesome community, though. Yeah, I mean, I, my house is I live, you know, a couple miles from. Yeah, the but I mean, I, I'm I'm not even referring to community as like the homes and how beautiful like the environment is. I'm talking about community about that in regards to, like the infrastructure of the people. I just feel like in that area, it's got a very, very unique community period. Right? Yeah, we we you know we definitely have each other's backs, even if you have a problem with someone. You know what I mean? And I yeah. feel like that's you, you kind of see it. Yeah. We definitely support our own a lot more than, than other places that I've been in the world. And I think that, that kind of bleeds through when you start a business. I mean, you know. Yeah. Like it's, you know, we, we it, a lot of people don't look at it as competition. They look at it as like this, you know, a rising tide lifts all ships. Kind of thing. Yeah. So I think that, that that happens with the block. Like you go in there and there's the owner of 618 is in there eating or, you know, the owner of another restaurant's in there and they're all supporting each other. Yeah. And I think that's the way to do it. Like, that's, you know, every brand that I own or have started or I do ad- advisory work for, that's always what I try to preach is, is fuck the competition. Think about how you can work with your competition to do this for everybody because mm-hmm. then everybody wins. And, it you know, the bourbon industry is a great example. I mean, when you look at spirits categories in general across the world, bourbon's small. You know what I mean? But if we if all the brands banded together and really used their voice to – to amplify and create more bourbon fans, it would it would work way faster than one brand trying to do it. And I think that there's a lot of places in Jersey that do that without realizing they're even doing it. And the block is one of them, mm-hmm. you know. Or Tommy's just a diabolical fucking genius and yeah. knew all along like what he was doing. But yeah. you know, um, every time I'm in there, I see other restaurant owners and brand owners and all that kind of stuff. That's so. definitely the fucking hub. Yeah. And I think it's like the spot. It's like. Back in the day, what Wolfgang, Wolfgang Puck's first restaurant in in um, in Hollywood. That's yeah, what right. it reminded us. And you keep and referring to collaborations and and talking about like how other businesses, like the the Jonathan, he reached out to the best of the best with bourbon, right? Yeah. I think it has a lot to do with confidence within yourself too, though, because I feel like if you're not if you're so like rejecting of like collaborating with others, that means you're just insecure of your own thoughts, and you feel like you have to compete rather than being like, dude. Yeah. If I'm eating, you're eating. You're eating. I'm good. There's enough money for everybody. Like, yeah, we're good. Yeah, but we're you get. I mean, you know, we're 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 ingrained like 
we're ingrained as a society to be in a scarcity mindset when it comes to money, right? Yeah. That's just the way it is. And when you start breaking that mold, nowadays you see more and more people kind of like breaking that norm. Yeah. And I think it's just because social media gives that opportunity. So much opportunity. You see so many different ways of thinking in life and everything. Um, you know, now you see more and more of that kind of collaboration happening. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty to go around, right? Yeah. Everything's abundant. It's just like you have to you got to figure that out for yourself, though, and, 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 you know, put yourself in a position to be able to build something that other people want to collaborate with to build something much bigger. Yeah. Right? Like, that's the whole thing behind that. The, you know, holdings company that I have is is I want to build it into a thing that has 30 brands within it, you know, and I have a team of people that are able to eat from it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not going to just bring the opportunity to keep them to myself and be like, nope, no. Yeah. I mean, I have a lead advisor in my brand. His name's Anthony Muscarella, and he's, you know, he, he's incredibly successful himself. But, you know, from all my opportunities with brands, he'll also get a piece of all that, you know. So, how do you juggle all of that? Friends, help. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's not that hard to juggle because everything that I do is pretty. It's pretty one lane, and mm-hmm. I can take it and apply it as a blueprint to every brand. I don't step out of my comfort zone when it comes to brands, like. I'm not going to become the guy that's trying to figure out the, you the, know, the operations of it or the yeah, exactly. or like sales approach. It's like, hey, like no, this sales is, approach, yes, yeah, marketing, yeah, you know, brand storytelling and and strategy and stuff, absolutely. But when it comes to, you know, being the person that's planning for the next year of sales and what we have to hit to make sure we remain profitable or we get to being profitable or go from red to black or all mm-hmm. that, I don't do that. You know what I mean? And I think some people try to take all of it on themselves mm-hmm. and they try to do too much and then they get overwhelmed and then that's when a brand, you know, suffers rather than, you know, sticking to your strengths and then working with your team and letting them do what they do, you know, well. And like that's that's kind of how I've been able to move around and how different, you know, so many different companies under the umbrella that we've got right now. I think it's also back to the confidence thing. I think it's also that as well, because like. I feel like it also takes confidence and also time to figure out what your did fucking you lane up, is. Did you look up our ethos for – did you get a hold of the deck somehow? No. Nah, why? Because confidence is one of the pillars. <laughs> oh, that's what exuberates, brother. That's what exuberates. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know – and when we reference it in the in the brand deck, like, you know, it's it's the confidence in, like, the Bob Dylans, the Joan Didions, and what their craft You're a big was. Bob Dylan guy? Or what he Jonathan, is, Jonathan and I are both huge Bob Dylan fans, and it's just this common thread that linked us together in the beginning that made all of us mm. kind of like connect. But he's referenced a lot, yeah, you know, throughout the the building of our brand, just from the different things he's been able to do and who he is and all that, and his you know how he's forged his own path, you know, and been as unique of a character as you could possibly be. Yeah. So, but confidence is is one of the you know the main pillars main pillars of the brand. Yeah. And, Timothy uh, Chalamet, they're doing that biopic of Bob Dylan. Mm-hmm. They shot a ton of movies in Hoboken, and, and then the main movie right now is the Bob Dylan movie. Yeah, isn't there a bunch of movie set or movie studios here and stuff? Yeah, I mean, they're now Hoboken. I was talking to one of the producers because we catered um, like the the film crew, and I was asking like, why the fuck are they always in Hoboken now? Yeah, and it's the tax credit. Yep. And it's cheaper than being in the West they're Village. All moving to, they're all moving to right by me now. Yeah. Netflix and all these different. That's going to fuck it. They're all moving mm. to Fort, Fort Monmouth, which is like. It used to be the. It was a military. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. My wife and I looked at a house in there five years ago. Uh, Skyrocketed? Yeah. It was the general's quarters. So it was like at the end of Officer Row. So it was all the, the officer's barracks that are now apartments. And there's this huge house that looked like Kevin McAllister's house from Home Alone. No right way. At the end. And we were like, they they were asked, they weren't asking much for it, but it needed like sewer rent. It needed all sorts of shit. Yes. All it needed to be fully redone. But we were considering it, but they were like, you can't put a fence in. You can't put a pool. You can't do anything because it's all historic. Oh. So we were like, we're not doing that. Yeah. Um, but what they're what they're doing in there is, is it's fucking wild. I mean, there's breweries in there there's gyms restaurants bars they're doing a whole water walk there's you know five million dollar houses it's it's pretty crazy they're what, building like their whole own city. what county is that monmouth county monmouth county yeah. Yeah, yeah monmouth and ocean county are just booming yeah and it's before it used to be like um all tourists going there like to jersey tourists but COVID. now it's like COVID. yeah now it's just fucking people living there all year COVID happened and it literally just you know every Excuse me, a lot of people who own homes out in the Hamptons sold their homes in the Hamptons, bought down by us. And yeah. Then they came down and just stayed. So now there's this big, 
year-round population that, you know, we've always had a pretty big year-round population there, mm-hmm. but now I think it's kind of swelled as far as um, affluence. Yeah. So it's it's garnering all these different things to be popped up and what Kushner's doing alone in Long Branch. Yeah, with he, the Pier Village, right? Well, now there's now he's doing Broadway. Like, the main, the main street in Long Branch that runs east to west is called Broadway, and it's all these old industrial buildings. It looks a lot like a Hoboken or New York, and... Mm-hmm. He owns all of it, and he's redeveloping all of it right now. No So way. it's going to be like a new Asbury Park, which if you know what Asbury was fucking 15 years ago yeah. it, to what it is now, yeah. he's just basically doing the same exact thing in Long Branch. Are they ever going to fix AC, man? <laughs> like <laughs> That's why I grew up in Ocean City, so AC was like, I mean, I was sneaking into bars when I was Yeah, dude, 16. and I used to go there, yeah. But now it's, I feel like I haven't been there in years, but I feel like it's dumped a truck. It, it's bad. Yeah, I feel like they keep trying, but they. Yeah. It, it, I. They, I don't know what the hell the answer. It's just. It's just is. too far. Like for people, I guess. I don't know. If it's too far. It's just. They just can't fix it up. No, that place is. I don't know. If I had the answers to that, I'd be a fucking billionaire. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's pretty badass that Jared Kushner is like investing that much money in Jersey like that, though, dude. Yeah, like, I mean it's. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, he owns. He owns a huge swath of Asbury Park. He owns most of Long Branch, you know. Whether you identify or don't identify with that family, I, I would say just from a pure business sense of what they've been able to do is pretty staggering. Yeah, you know? regardless of his political political affiliates yeah, or whatever it may be. They've created a lot of jobs. They've also, you know, I think the development of Broadway has caused a lot of people to be pissed because it's, 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 it's going to change. And it's yeah. going to change, you know, and there's those people that are always going to fight against change. But, you know, it's... Yeah, it's pretty crazy to see what he does on a year- yearly basis in our area. Yeah, man, it's wild. And it's crazy too to see like the how how different it's being like branded too within Pure Village and now like all these bigger companies now coming into these markets. I feel like now because before down the shore it used to be like a lot of mom and pops. Yeah, I think that's what people get pissed about. Yeah, those start going away, people get pissed. Yeah, so but it's sad because it's so difficult. The cost to compete, the cost to, to pay, pay to play mm-hmm. is just so much higher now. Well, yeah. I mean, what the hell did I just read? I read it to my wife this morning. In in 1999, if you made $80,000 in 1999, you'd have to make $280,000 now to live the same life. That's wild. Yeah, it's a pretty crazy statistic. I was like, fuck, that's scary. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> like, I feel like we're, like, the last generation for, I don't, I think our kids are kind of fucked with, like, gen- creating, like, wealth for their, like, from start. Well, it's on us. Yeah. Right? That's why you're building what you're building and I'm trying to build what I'm building is generational wealth. So yes. They can start their own companies because I do feel like it's. The gap is just so much larger. Yeah. Like, there's, crazy. I don't think, like, a, you could just create a startup just from just being that guy without any additional capital or anything like that. No. There's just no way. No, you need the, you need the, the, you need the network to do it. Yeah. You need, like, a built in network to automatically launch. But to have a brand be successful, you almost need to have an automatic network. And that was something that, you know, with all the brands that, that we've got right now, every person that's involved in the brands, they all have an amazing network, right? So when they go out, like your network is your net worth, right? That saying is pretty fucking true. Yeah. When you go out and you launch a brand, if you don't have direct friends that will buy it and support it right off the bat, you're going to have a pretty tough time. Yeah. Because you're not going to understand your comp set. You're not going to understand even how to market it to someone unless you can turn. If I couldn't sell you one of my brands, it'd be tough to understand how to go and reach that demographic without knowing someone within it. You know what I mean? So I feel like with, you know, with our kids, it's, yeah, they're going to need to have something built before they they do it, you know? And don't you feel like, because I know you're obviously so heavily involved with marketing and branding. Are you happy that we, because I'm around the same age as you, they're like, we didn't grow up with social media. I'm way older than you, did. I'm 90. What are you, 85? 43. 43? Yeah. Uh, well, I, well, hopefully I don't. I age as well as you, my man. I mean, way too many fucking bagels. Um, what What did you ask me? Just about like the, the social media side of things. You know, it's like are like. What am I scared about it? Yeah, with with, with it, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I fucking that's shit. It's. I, I feel like if you raise them right, though, you know, they learn it's a tool, yeah. not a must. Yeah, and they understand they can build something out of it. But yeah. my biggest fear is how many kids i see like this at dinners the beach is a good example i was the at the beach, beach the other day wild. and my kids are running around like i don't let my kids hold a phone we don't have tablets we don't have any of that shit they mm-hmm. get to watch slow moving cartoons or like my my oldest son likes watching um 
car crashes. <laughs> well, how old's your son? He's three now. I'll be four in my, my My two-year-old, literally, we just have a school bus just drive. It's, yeah. it's on YouTube. The animation? It's just, it's, like driving around loops? And no, no it's not even animation. It's literally just uh, an hour-long thing of, a, like, of different turns of the bus on the streets. That's it, man. Or really? just Rachel. Yeah, seriously. Okay, yeah. So It's like low stimulating things. Or like Blippi. Yes. Who sold for billions somehow. That Wild, kid. bro. It's crazy. The kid space is nuts. But yeah, I... I, I was on the we were on the beach the other day and my two kids are running out, my wife and I are sitting there and I I turn and there's like some kids in their I don't know, maybe late teens, early twenties. There's like different packs of them and every single one of them was like this. And they're on the beach and I'm like yeah, you're on the beach. Like like I understand if you're like home by yourself and you're just bored. Yeah. You're at the beach. I don't know. I mean I, I think that I'm not going to start turning into a conspiracy theorist and going down the wormhole fucking... It's all good, man. I'm welcoming it. uh, (laughs) It's up to you, man. Of subconscious social programming and shit like that. But, you know, the most easily programmable, movable people are ones that are occupied, Mm -hmm. right? Or entranced. So it's like, as much as this thing can be a tool, it can be a prison too, right? So that's why I teach my kids, like, I you know... try to get them in the ocean snowboarding out in nature and get them to love things like that mm-hmm. so that once that choice comes where they're choosing one or the other they're going to choose the one that they're you know they feel a deeper connection to and not some topical like dopamine rush yes. you know what i mean yeah and that's i think it's i think as parents i mean i think every ge- every generation has its their difficult social media yeah you know it's like you see that photo of Oh, everybody talks about your phone now, but imagine being back in the 70s, everyone's reading a newspaper. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Every generation has that, in my opinion, but I think our generation has the biggest challenge as parents because of AI and how the dopamine hits happen and how quickly you can get justific- social justification by going onto a you know social media app or yeah. that kind of stuff. So it's scary, but I feel like it's only as scary as you make it. Fair. You, know, you can... You can you can dictate what your kids do and don't do for a certain amount of time, right? Mm-hmm. So if you build an in, you build an empire yourself, you can really control it mm-hmm. for a mm-hmm. much longer time. Not control them, but you can you can give them the tools that most people don't have. And that's like been my goal with with building all of this stuff is like giving my kids the knowledge that I learned the things I was never taught, but also how the things I never had. And I don't mean that for material; I mean the opportunities. You know what I mean? And you brought on this before. You said people. People like things without even knowing why they like it. Mm. What did you mean by that? Like Nike is a great example. Mm. Anyone wearing Nikes? I got Nikes. Nikes. So, you know, when I mean, four of us, you know what I mean? Like the ratio is, that's kind of the ratio. When, you know, when, when Bowerman created Nike and and then they built that whole thing, it's like, we, we see the solution. Some people are like, if you just walk up to a general person, ask them why they bought the the pair of shoes they have. Mm -hmm. They might not be able to answer you. They might say, oh, I like them. Mm-hmm. But there's a million pairs that look exactly like Nike Dunks that you, yeah. on, you can buy, right? A lot of people, and I'm not saying you, I'm just saying yeah, the general goes, yeah. public doesn't dive deep enough into the subconscious, you know, subliminal messaging that happens with branding. The reason people buy Nike most of the time is because they think Nike can make them run like Usain Bolt, mm-hmm. play basketball like LeBron, mm-hmm. you know, skateboard like P-Rod, mm-hmm. whatever it is, mm-hmm. whoever like the person all, is, like they Lewis, up, yeah. whoever they look up to, they're seeing them using Nike and it's that affiliation of like, well, maybe it'll make me just that much better. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And they, and, they, and, they, and they buy it and they support it. So that's what I meant. Like, you know, that's that subconscious connection to things. I mean, we're all guilty of it. Why do we all use Mac instead of using um, Yeah. Android or whatever it may be. It's just yeah. because every 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 experience of the brand just ties to an emotional thing that we don't even realize, you know, from the packaging being so so you know minimalistic and easy to to use, mm-hmm. right? It's yeah. like that's it all plays into it. It's that brand experience, right? It's creating a brand experience and emotional touch points that people don't even know why they're like, I want that. Yeah, you know, aside from the scarcity aspect of it. And it's almost like amazing to see how now modern you know social media is with all these influencers and and i just saw recently jake paul just uh, is now launching a deodorant and then you have logan paul with his prime and it's amazing to see either love hate or respect I know, it is it is amazing to see what they put what they've been able to do yeah like the fact that this kid is literally he just i don't know if you saw the piece of content he came out with deodorants called the w i just saw that 
I just saw like a press release that he's launching a thing called W, and I was I couldn't even read it to be honest with you. But and it's like <laughs> I I watched that piece of content, and after I'm like, holy shit! I like this kid is now going to be able to compete with right guard, axe, and all of them yeah. like that. Yeah. He's now in every single fucking Walmart. Well, that's like I mean, that's how he launched. That's just a, that's just the strength of social media. Like I, there's nothing more I I I, I think is more bullshit than when you see that meme of like um instagram having instagram followers like being rich and monopoly money Mm -hmm. it's not fucking true like it's not true look how many people got rich because of social media like they got rich off those those oh yes okay i was gonna i was i was i thought i thought you were saying the opposite no no, no, dude like i see that and and as a person who has taken paid campaigns yeah you have a large following yeah i know what kind of money goes into it and i'm like that's not a real thing. Like, you know, that's why when you ask 10, 12-year-olds what they want to be when they grow up, now they say fucking influencer, but yeah. being a firefighter. Like, yeah. it's crazy. So that the social media thing is, is, is wild. I mean, The Rock has the world's most valuable spirits burner. Does he? He's fucking, what, 18 months old? Does he? Billions. I didn't it's know that. Like, I, I don't, don't quote me. Let's just I mean, say he's, 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 he's definitely in the top five, top ten. Oh, top three i mean it's it's worth like fucking 10 billion dollars or some something wow and it's solely because of his his instagram so when they launched whoever came up with their launch strategy was brilliant any consumer that bought a bottle of terramana tequila and posted it on instagram and tagged the rock and terramana got reposted on his stories Mm. so you think about that how many fans he's got yeah and how many bottles that sold yeah yeah, because if 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 he reposted you, you had someone wants that that it's almost it's yeah. sometimes even me doing in this space and I know that it builds connections and all of that. I have one side of it, it's like a, the the angel in one arm being like you got to do this as the vehicle to be successful, especially in the food and beverage space and yeah. all the opportunities you can gain, right? And then the other side is like, dude, this is like an episode of fucking Black Mirror. Well, it is. We're we're. We're a fucking social experiment, dude. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, every every sign points to it being a social experiment, right? Or like a like a, uh, a neurological experiment. I mean, there was that scientist who, who, I don't know if you guys saw it. She, This is going down a serious wormhole, and I forget her name, but you can Google it. She started, she was a researcher who literally was like discovered somehow and proved it scientifically that we are an experiment worth an experiment in conscious thought and she was she died like, no way. like three days later and it's like like yeah what are the fucking chances of that saying that that's what it is but i mean what are the fucking chances of that? yeah and what what did she discover that was actually true did anything come out of what she said no i haven't like really dug down the wormhole i mean i listen to a lot of different podcasts that, you know between like billy carson's a friend of mine i don't know if you're familiar with billy but he's an astrophysicist and he's fucking brilliant and He's just he was just on Joe Joe Rogan's podcast and I listen to a lot of different things like that just because yeah. it's really cool to hear different theories on you know our our experience in this world and yeah. our experience with consciousness and stuff like that and they all talked they all touched on this woman and how that happened because she scientifically proved something and then all of a sudden she died and she was healthy and she died of like a heart attack or something <laughs> you know that's wild yeah man. it's crazy but. It's it's fascinating. I mean, even even just for sheer enjoyment purposes, even if it's not real, just reading about shit like that, fascinating. So, I know because I think no matter what, because when you when you hear about this, it's hard not to. I mean, I don't know if you feel like this, especially being a father and you're and you have all these businesses. There's never been a time in my life that I feel like these days are connecting so much faster. Yeah, yeah. And it's like almost a sign of Judgment Day, which is like they just they fucking connect faster it's and weird, faster yeah, and it's, faster it's weird i i said that to my wife the other day when we first had our kid i was like man everyone says time goes fast when your kids is lying like and now i'm like i blink and it goes from monday to friday and i'm like what yeah so billy carson oddly enough talks about how this how time as we says we know it from days the days having names to months is all a made-up constraint to control humans and our thought process because we now are so obsessed with doing things by certain ages mm. instead of just living in one like long timeline mm. we just obsess over these things so true so you start digging down that wormhole and you're like what the fuck like, no i'm crazy. totally guilty of that because i feel like even i put i'm 34 i just turned 34 like a few weeks ago and i have 35 just set in my mind so aggressively because it was the year my dad opened the first Obagel. Yeah. And I have this thing that I just want to hit a certain level because I want to make him proud and know that like I didn't I always want I'm like my biggest fear is to 
now I know that I'm not at this point in my career, but I never wanted to be like, and nothing's wrong with this, but I never wanted to be the second gen deli guy who's at the same deli. Yeah, you want, you know to, what I mean? you want to evolve. Evolve and I think expand you've evolved it. it, dude. I'd say, well, I mean, you guys know better than I do. I mean, for, for what I've seen and what you've shown me and that, that new idea you have, I'd say you fucking evolved it. No, I appreciate <laughs> that, man. I'm excited for like where the future holds. We have a lot of different things in, in, in the works. And now it's about just like juggling my time. But when you're saying that about the age, it's so true. Yeah. Because like, especially now with having kids, ha- like, you know, because you just want to create that ultimate sense of like wealth for your family but you don't want to what the biggest fear is is like all of a sudden you're doing that you're putting your head down next thing you know it's 15 years goes by and your kid's like 17 years old and it's like that's why i said that's why i said and then that's what that's what my question was going to lead to is you put a lot of time into your kids so how how do you know because there's for me i mean this is just me personally yeah and this is a personal belief i hold there's way more definitions to wealth than just a a number in the bank right agreed and i think that for us as entrepreneurs and doing like what we do on a daily basis we could easily get caught up in working 20 hours yeah right for sure but i try to look at where i'm going to be when i'm much much older and look at the things that i would regret now Mm. and make sure that i don't do them right it's like this a foreshadowing, I guess. I don't yeah. Know. It's just an exercise in consciousness and trying to be as present as possible. I think because of where I personally came from with surfing and everything, everything I've ever done from a sport from I, I started jujitsu in my 40s, you know, I surfing, snowboarding, everything that I've done, you have to be you have to be present mm-hmm. because if you're not, you're going to get fucking hurt. Mm. So I think that presence of mind's always been ingrained in me. So I just can I just do that with my kids. Like when they need my time, they have my time. You know what I mean? It's a hard balance because you can get caught up, caught up with, oh, I just have to answer an email or I'm just yeah. doing some work and things like that. But I think you can break it by just being as like have a grounding mechanism that then when they answer that question, you stop for a second and realize what they're asking because they're just asking for your time. And, you know, for me, there's nothing more important than my kids. Yeah. So if I'm doing something that I can walk away from, I walk away from it basically, you know, and I think that, you know, developing goals for yourself is a great thing to strive towards because I can, I know, I'm sure you're fucking, you set your goals super high, so yeah. you set them high, you fell high. Yeah, right? exactly. So you're still going to, you're still going to perform extremely well. So for me, I set them high and usually I don't hit them, but I can still get close while still maintaining that closeness with my kids because yeah. i mean let's be real we only have them for 12 years i know you know like once they start getting gaining that that social circle they're out of the house and yeah. they're like okay they don't think it's cool to go to the supermarket with you anymore well unless you're <laughs> really fucking cool yeah. <laughs> yeah if i drink frank august they'll be wanting to go to the supermarket with me until they eat till they're 18 yeah right no that's yeah. awesome man yeah so i don't know i think par- parenting is a, a wild Fucking, it's a wild world for sure. Yeah, and when you said about the goals, I feel like my main thing, how I I want to start working more on like a macro of like five, ten year plan, but I always do is just a year, one to two year plan as like super high level macro goal, and then I just break it down backwards and yeah. then edit micro over week to week. Because if not, I'm so ADD that I'll just be all over the place. And busyness is the key weakness to leadership. You know, yeah. like sometimes you get caught up in the weeds and the the bullshit. Busy doesn't mean you're effective. Yes. Yeah. And someone that you're talking to is being like, dude, I'm so busy. It's like sometimes that person's actually not even performing at a high level. The yeah. people that are performing at a high level have all these things going on yeah. but are very cool, calm, and collected. I saw this thing the other day, and it was like – I forget what it said exactly, so don't quote me verbatim. But it was something like, you know, the idea isn't to check things off your to-do list. It's to have less to do, right, and be more effective in the things that you do do. So it's like, you know, with me, that's that's – that's what I've learned in the process of building Frank August. I mean, I, I had a lot of shortcomings when it came to certain things in, in our partnership with these guys. And I've been friends with them for so long that, you know, I had like a full dark night of the soul experience where I literally had to reevaluate every belief I had in myself for anything that was outside of surfing or social media or any of that. Like really my approach and understanding of business, of growing a business and, and all of that. You know what I mean? So what was that moment? You said you have like a... So, I mean, this is a really serious like look under the hood, but, you know, we all we all came to the to the table with what our role purview is going to be for the brand. Right? Yeah. 
based on our experience and existence at that point in time. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty obvious what Jonathan would do. It was very obvious what Thompson would do. With mm-hmm. me, it was a little bit less obvious. But when I brought what I thought I was going to be really good out to the table, it, it frailed in comparison to what we had created with the brand. Mm-hmm. And it made me step back and be like, you know, all along I thought this was going to be what I was going to be doing. And now that I know it isn't, like, what the fuck do I do? Yeah. You know, like, because I'm not one of those guys that's going to fight to own a ton of a company that I'm not doing anything for. Yeah. Right? It's just not fair. Yeah. So I really just step back and be like, look around and, and, and really figure out what my strong suits were outside of what I thought they were. And it was this, it was, it was rough for like a year. Mm-hmm. You know, like I went to bed every night, like having Fuck. these fucking conversations with myself of just like, you know, conversations in my head of either me talking to Jonathan or me talking to Thompson, all three of us talking to each other and going over all these different things. You know what I mean? So just... Yeah, there's a lot of self-discovery that happened with this brand. So for me, truthfully, this is the first brand that I I launched. That's how I see it mm-hmm. because it's, I learned way more about myself with this. I mean, if I rewind to when we were starting versus where I am now mentally and from just a business acumen, it's astronomically different. How did you get to the – like what – how did you get to that point? Because I feel like a lot of people deal with that too, man. I think that's very relatable. I think a lot of people have their, you know, those inner demons of being like, what am I really fucking good at? What am I supposed to be doing on a day-to-day basis? Am I doing the right thing on a day-to-day basis? I think it was it was just looking at what what, what I could do, you know, and what was left to be done for the mm-hmm. brand. And, and, and is that something that I'm good at doing yeah. and stepping into it and getting better at it, right? Um, it was... There wasn't any one moment. It was just a. It was a pretty big growth period. I mean, I, and and both my business partners know. I mean, I don't think they know the extent to where it took me mentally. And at the mm-hmm. same point in time, while all this was going on, I had a son who was born, was in the NICU, was on life support for a month, was wow. was, was born not breathing, no pulse, no anything. So it's like I was balancing all this stuff. So I was going through all these different growth phases, mm-hmm. like all at the same time. But it wasn't any one thing. It was just a realization, like, if I really want to build this, let's call it high nine figure holding tank of a, of a trust for my kids and my family, I got to get real about what I'm good at. And I need to really lean into it. And it can't just be this haphazard, like, oh, I'm good at networking. Like, it has to be a skill, mm-hmm. you know, um, whether it's sales or branding or marketing, storytelling, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what led to it, me sitting down and really talking to my wife, my friends and things like that. And and understanding what they see me as being good at because that kind of helped give me that input to like facilitate growing these brands now no it's beautiful man and i feel like honestly i guarantee your business partners probably had of their own obstacles too you know what i mean there's no doubt about it it. yeah that's what the entrepreneurial world is is it's a beautiful place but it's a very lonely place you know that's why when you go on instagram and you see someone's fucking bio and it says entrepreneur everybody says it and you're like are you? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, are you? Yeah, just because you have like one thing, it doesn't mean you're out. Or it's like a tr- or it's like a full on. And I know I said trust fund, but like it's a full trust fund kid that just doesn't understand the meaning behind like yes. it hasn't worked for anything. Yes. And they go and they launch a brand, and their dad's network was already there, so they just sold it. To, like, I don't know. I think the word entrepreneur is is used a little bit too haphazardly these days. It was never used before. Then all of a sudden, it started being used. Then Gary V came into the game. He was in the beginning of on, of uh, social media. Yeah. And he just fucking knew the knew the tools at that point. Yeah. yeah and yeah. then all of a sudden, it's like that generation. Yeah. I think anybody that thinks tries to do something for themselves, work for themselves, whether it's being an influencer, or doing your own brand, or whatever it is, being a fucking life coach, which I think that's one of the yeah. ridiculous titles ever. But, you know... Um, yeah, I think that word's just a little too overused, and and it devalues the people that are truly doing things in that space, like like yourself and mm-hmm. you know my partners and things like that. It's like you say you're an entrepreneur; everyone's an entrepreneur now. Yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah, like who, who's really on your team, and how many yeah. people do you really have on your team, and how, yeah. who are you responsible of, and what are your liabilities, and all of that. Yeah, when it comes to your personal brand, you're so good at sending. Like you have this like great sense of like professionalism to it do i no you do man you really do and you have like a really cool aesthetic you know you could tell your your do you have a purposeful like content calendar like how are you going about it no no there it you know social media you're talking about social media yeah social media it it evolved in its own accord with me i you know 
I, 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 like I said, I grew up with very little. I made decent money surfing, but nothing crazy. And then mm-hmm. when I started modeling, it was even better money. And then when the social media thing happened and had a following and I was getting these offers from brands, I'd never seen money like that in my life. Mm-hmm. So I kind of let it. At first, I cannibalized everything because I was like, I don't know how long Instagram is. It's 2013, 14. Mm. I don't know how long it's going to be around. I'll take all the money I can. Yeah. You know, and, and, um, it started evolving, and I started seeing what it was evolving into. And actually, it's really crazy because the conversation with Jonathan, who's now my partner and CEO, the year I met him is what changed my perspective on social media. Mm-hmm. I was po- At that point in time, I was posting brand collaborations and modeling shit, and he sat me down. He's like, dude, you know how big of a tool this thing is? And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, it's making me money. He's like, no, 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 no. What this is going to be and how this can create other things in the future for you and be a foundation, you need to start – putting out who you are instead of what you think people want to see hmm. because when i met him he's a, he's not a very impressionable dude like hmm. he's the most discerning guy i know to a degree where it's like you could paint the mona lisa in front of him and he probably die. i think fucking sucks <laughs> like yeah he's like that yeah and, and he was like i know you love cars you've raced cars you're surfing i know at this point in time no one even really knew other than people that followed me from my knowing my name from surfing i never post him surfing mm-hmm. He's like, start posting your real life and, and understand that this is what people are going to see and, and know of you in the future because they're just going to use Google. So I started kind of like putting more of my actual life out that mm-hmm. was real and like things that were actually going on. I mean, I talked about the loss of my mom, my father, my, my mother-in-law, you know, my wife's grandfather, you know, I broadcast everything that happened with my son. And it wasn't in a way to garner likes or attention. It was because that's genuinely what was going on in my life. And that, in turn, kind of got people that were writing to me and saying things like, you know, I follow influencers, but, like, I can't quite figure out what you are. But, like, whatever you are, it's amazing because mm-hmm. yeah, I can relate to the things you're going through because you're actually talking about them. You're not just showing yourself in, like, Guys, sand like all the time. fucking sailboat. Yes. You know? And so that's kind of been the ethos for me. And then when we launched Frank, there was a... A, an agreement that I would remain somewhat quiet because the last thing we wanted anyone to do was look me up and denote me as an influencer mm-hmm. and then try to pigeonhole our brand. Yes. You know, um, which easily happens nowadays. Yeah. And, you know, now when you look at my, my feed, it's a little bit more of my full, my family, the entrepreneur side of things. I talk about different things like that. So I think it's just, it's evolved as my life has evolved, mm-hmm. you know? So I don't put a lot of strategy behind it because mm-hmm. in the pie of everything I'm doing, Social media is is minimal these days. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I don't really let let it take up too much time. Is that why you have so much time that you put into your kids because of what happened with your parents? Maybe subconsciously. Yeah. You know? My dad was my dad worked my dad was a doc master when I was growing up. He started he, he started this foreign company with his buddy, was offered to be a partner, didn't do it. Because he was the ultimate guy that wanted to control his own calendar. You know, he he had the opportunity to own a really big marina management company when I was growing up that would have secured him a lot of money, but he d- he decided to struggle so that he could be time rich mm-hmm. in the end. And it's like, you know, my childhood was my dad working super, super hard, but he did have time for me at the end of the day every time. Mm-hmm. He was at all my contests, surfing that he could come to and, you know, super supportive. Whenever I was just free surfing, he was on the beach no matter how cold it was. And I just see my relationship with him and how I spoke about him on social media when he passed. And the responses I got from other people who were like, I wish I had that relationship with my dad. My dad was always working. Or my dad was this. My dad was that. And I was like, I'm not going to be that. Mm-hmm. I want to be the next evolution of what my dad was to yeah. me. So I think it just plays into how I just naturally react, you know, and I think this, my kids. And I think the Frank August is named after him with Frank. It's not named after him. It's inspired by him. Inspired and then the name him. Frank actually just kind of like fit what the brand is. Yes. Frank, by definition, is marked by free, forthright, and sincere expression. Mm-hmm. And that's what the so maybe subconsciously in a way. Yeah, yeah. So it just kind of it was conceptually what inspired it, mm-hmm. but it's not what it is. So it just kind of like happened that way, which is kind of like, you know, it's kind of it's kind of beautiful the way it all happened. But, yeah, man. Um, but yeah, I think for the for the, the the time with the kids, I think it just comes from you know seeing a lot of kids who aren't connected to their parents and mm-hmm. being like, I'm not going to be that. Like, I'm going to be a positive role model my kids life for as long as i can so hell yeah man well you're doing a great job with it man and i i admire it because as being a father i see that and uh i respect it so how we know we have a tradition of how we normally conclude this is um what's the most impactful advice that you've ever been given fuck that's a that's a really good question 
Um, and whatever that like, comes to your mind first is kind of that. Yeah. You know? So and I feel like you might have like 10 in your mind right now. No, no, no. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I don't. Um, my dad always taught me. He always said to me, believe none of what you see, none of what you hear, and all of what you feel. So that's how I've like operated always. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's that gut instinct that I think we all kind of like neglect a lot of the times. But like someone walks in a room, you know, if you like them or not, usually, mm-hmm. you know, even with a second chance, sometimes they come around a little bit, but they're mm-hmm. still that like, mm. so for me, that's, yeah, that's probably the most poignant that's, that's stayed with me throughout my life. Hell yeah, man. That's beautiful, bro. I really, out of, out of all of them, <laughs> I like that one the most. Seriously, I mean that. It's funny. Every time I do these types of things, I have these like realizations that make me evolve more the next time around. Mm. Always. Hell yeah. Yeah. It's, it's They're always fun, though. I always try to, this time around, and I'm happy that we did, but like I can't help myself. But like what I'm actually interested in is what you were saying about like them being like Nero, like subconsciously like understanding what the hell's going on. You know what I mean? Those yeah. conspiracy. People keep on calling conspiracy theories like oh, a negative no. connotation, but like... <laughs> I think it's very truthful. Well, have you ever, have you ever, I don't know if any of you guys have ever looked at it, but there's a, there's a, there's a neurophysicist that proved that we literally only comprehend like 0.01% of true reality of what's actually going on around us. Wow. And it's fucking point two? Point, like, yeah, it's, the, 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 it's, it's. I mean, if we comprehended everything though, you know, like, yeah, it's so yeah. brutal, why would your brain, you brain you'd explode? explode. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh my be AI, dude. Yeah. What are your thoughts on AI? That freaks me the, f- like, I'm, I've been keep on trying to use it as a tool. <laughs> yeah, that's a rabbit hole. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I use chat GPT for certain things, but really, I use it because I'm just curious where it's going. Yes. Right? It freaks me out to a certain extent just because, like, I mean, fuck, man. I, you got to wonder how deep the, the rabbit hole goes, like, our, 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 there was this whole theory that I read about. This is a far out theory, but it's fucking wild. Someone was like, all movies that are out there are different. So there's there's 13 dimensions, right? And it's proven. Or 11 dimensions, I'm sorry. Okay. And each dimension gets more and more evolved as you go. And they're saying that at every time, all those dimensions are happening at the same time. They're just layered, right? It's like the wormhole theory where you poke a hole through and make you can, you can basically transport yourself. Yes. But they're saying that, you know movies are actually real like they're real cases of shit that's happened in other dimensions and it's like they're dictating what is going to be the the future for us so when you look at movies that were made in like the 80s yeah certain things have happened like the simpsons that's you see yes. that shit yes okay that right so think about that but in a movie sense so it's like you think about movies and robots and what they i robot fucking exactly the movie her that's what i'm saying the movie her is like so i mean how is that not going to be what happening in the future you know there's a a girl making fucking wally Wally. yeah my wife's favorite my wife (laughs) loves wally and that's fucking completely true obesity and all that shit yeah it's like the screen for them don't know what's happening around them exactly not fucking augmented reality but yeah it's for me, it's fucking, you know, it's 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 wild because we can see the writing on the wall, yet we're still like, just, leave it there. just push it a little further. Like, it's fucking scary. It is. And it's like almost you can kind of see what's going to inevitably happen, which I feel like it might be. Do you know who Billy Carson is? No, I need to look into him. Have you guys, have you guys ever heard of Forbidden Knowledge? It's a fucking millions of followers on Instagram. They have their own TV show. Billy. Billy Carson. Look up. Billy Carson, listen to him on any. Yes, podcast. I have seen him too. So Billy's a good friend of mine. And no way, bro. Is... You could probably do. Th- he, he doesn't he say he got abducted? No, he doesn't say he was abducted. He basically saw a UFO when he was a kid. He lived near um, near. Uh, he lived in Florida near Kennedy Space Center. Okay. This, and saw something when he was a kid that basically altered his whole reality and mm-hmm. how he like perceived the world. Yeah. And he became a fucking dude astrophysicist. He owns a space guy. I mean, it's it's pretty wild the way his brain works. But out of all the guys that are in that space, if you listen to things with him, he still talks very dumbed down in the sense you can fully understand what he's talking about. And he breaks it down in the sense that, like, is relatable to us. When he mm-hmm. talks about, like, muons and neurons and black holes and shit, most, most scientists are like, fuck. He's, like, almost like, first it was, like, Bill Nye, then it was Neil deGrasse. DeGrasse. Yeah, nice and then now I feel like he's the next guy, you he's know? Next, but some of his, his, his understanding of the pyramids and different... Sorry, listening to him because it's the one with Joe Rogan. He was just on Joe Rogan. They talked for like three hours, and some of the shit they talk about is 
It, it, it's fucking. It's like um, it's how crazy. when um, Terrence uh, Howard too. He just came Terrence out of nowhere with that shit, right? Yeah, yeah. What'd you say? No, nothing. You're gonna make fun. What? That I think mermaids exist. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're probably right. Eighty yeah. percent of our oceans often discovered. This is like funny because Jadis always brings up something with Disney, and the fact that you were said Wally. Hey. And he yeah, he's gonna run with that. It's funny. I um, I drank with Terrence Howard like quite a few times. Yeah. Hung out with him, and he was not whatever is going on with him right now. That was not who this person was. Yeah, man. It's almost like him and Cat Williams. Like, what the hell? They they got on. Unru- maybe they were like under like a drug or something of the Illuminati. And I mean, maybe, got maybe fucking maybe maybe they did DMT or whatever. Probably. But but like you know, Tesla was the same way. I mean, I my whole arm is tattooed. This is all. What is that? That's super fucking it's clean a, art. It's a Tesla coil. That's sick, man. And that's Tesla. Wow. Da Vinci and you know um, all that all that stuff, but. Yeah, dude, I, I I feel like some of those pe- some of these people are given information that we're not, and they just like fucking start spouting out of the mouth all this crazy shit, and everyone thinks they're nuts until a couple of years later, and all of a sudden it all makes yeah. sense, and you're like, like Tesla, I mean, fuck, dude, Edison had everyone thinking he was batshit crazy, and then when he fucking died, the FBI raided his place in 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 Bryant Park and took all his paperwork and all of his fucking everything because he was going to give electricity away for free, mm. like. It's crazy. And that's why Elon's saying something. He's against uh, a chat GPT being a part of Apple. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't, I don't, I don't know either. I try not. Dude, there's so much out there that distracts from, like, whatever my personal mission is. I just try not to go down those wormholes because you could you could turn it. Into- Even though you're listening to three hours of Billy Carson <laughs> or Rogan. But I, mean, I, I know Billy. So I already kind of know what I'm getting yeah. into when he starts talking. And a lot of the way that he speaks about how we literally are in control of our own destinies. But you have to break free of this. That's why I listen to him because – you know, a lot of what I've done in my life happened because I broke free of like certain yes, the norm thinking and of the sh- box. Yeah, 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 out of the box. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, before I leave, I my my father, my, my mom and dad can travel with me a lot when I was competing growing up mm-hmm. surfing. So this couple, Todd and Megan DeCercio, were able to. Todd was a really good surfer. He's about eleven years older than me. Megan, his wife, went on to become the global vice president of Tommy Hilfiger for years. And so Tommy outfitted me for my wedding with a personal touch from his no collection. Way. He outfitted all my groomsmen. So he was the one tailoring us, right? Tommy Hilfiger? Yeah, so. He pinned in the mouth and all? So, oh, dude, <laughs> all of it. So he, uh, he, she, Megan told us a story. She, she was like, you know, I knew you'd love Tommy. And she told me this story of, of how they had someone come in to their offices to give them like a, like a team talk and, um, they basically ushered in this thought of like putting your arms up in the sky first thing in the morning and projecting exactly how you wanted your day and your life to mm-hmm. unfold. And Megan's like, I, Megan's and Todd have been connected to something different their whole lives. They've been able to like literally manifest. Word everything. manifest has been overplayed recently, mm-hmm. but they've been doing it since I was a kid. Like mm-hmm. everything they've ever, she was like, I'm going to start making suits. And all of a sudden, G loves wearing her fucking suits. And, you know, all these celebrities and shit. I'm like, how you don't just make that happen? Like, yeah, something else, whatever. So she explains this theory to me, and she's like, Tommy does it every day. So I'm like, fuck, if he does it, I'm going to go home and do it. Mm-hmm. So I started doing it in maybe 2015, and my wife watched me, and she was like, it's wild. Since you started doing that, everything you've put out has happened. So I just as this. What is it? It's literally putting your hands up and, like, freeing your mind of anything that's happening outside of you and literally just being like, this is really how I want my day to unfold or this is what I want to achieve. This is what I want to happen, and you have to do it. You have to, like, believe it, right? You can't be like, oh, there's a part of me that doesn't no, believe yeah. this shit's real. But I've always believed that that stuff's real. So for me, it came naturally. And I started seeing all these things happen. So I've told certain friends and stuff about it. And last year, I told this dude, Matt, who is, like, the least, like, spiritual kind of God. person yeah. to believe in that. He's, like, a financier, you know. So I told him that, and he's like, okay, all right. Like, kind of like I could see him just being like, you're fucking nuts. And then he texts me three days later. He's like, dude, I don't know if this is happenstance or not, but I went, he's a big fisherman. He's like, I went fishing. I was out fishing. They were fishing for 25 hours, not a fucking single bite. So he said to the dude on the boat, he's like, all right, you're going to think I'm fucking nuts, but we'll try this thing because this guy Louis told me. So he did it. And two minutes later, they fucking started just reeling to go onto the boat. And he sent me photos of all two. And he's like, dude, the wildest experience of my life. And I met the guy that was in the boat with him like three, three, four weeks ago. And he was like, 
whatever the fuck you're tapped into, dude, it's a different thing because this shit happened and I was there and I watched it and it was fucking crazy. And now I started doing it and now I'm getting a new job that I always wanted. And I'm like, it's crazy. I believe in that. And I also think it's like another version of prayer, right? It is. It's, it's all, that's, that's all, all it is. prayer is, right? Prayer's just gotten diluted over the years. Yeah. So that's kind of what it is. I totally believe in that, man. Yeah. I actually just started doing that a little bit more recently, if anything. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate you coming here, man. It means a lot to me. And I know that yeah, uh, you guys are doing some amazing things. And uh, I'm excited to see this continue to grow. Yeah. I'm doing a Father's Day tasting tomorrow, actually. No way. Where? A place called Lavodi's. That sounds so familiar. Is that the Italian uh, grocery Markets? store? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, place is a, the first time I went there, I was like, in, I felt like I was like in a, I was like, it was like almost like a, like a, um, like a Disneyland for Italian grocery store. Yeah. This place yeah. is an institution. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's actually banging too. Mm. Like all homemade pastas, the sauces. Yes, yeah, one place has a liquor store, so I'm doing a um, I'm doing a tasting for three hours tomorrow. Hell yeah, bro! Yeah, probably a little far for you guys to try, but yeah, but good shit, man. Yeah. We'll definitely be. Uh, maybe I will check it out. Yep. Appreciate you, man. Thanks yeah. for coming, bro. Thank you. Thank you, dude. Cheers.